Welcome to the WOW Podcast, where we bring you inspiring stories and insights from our university community. Tune in for conversations about growth, success, and the power of communication in the academic world. So get ready to soar with us on the wings of wisdom. Hello, my name is Dr. Andrew Robo, and welcome to the Wings of Wisdom podcast with our dear friend and colleague and professor, uh, Dr. Luis Mancha. Uh, we are going to be talking to him today. He is the chair of the philosophy department at Ashland University, where he's been since 2003. He brings a wealth of experience and knowledge from the studies uh, starting at Rice University and then later at a much bigger institution that is uh, still fantastic, Purdue. His journey in academia is marked by his dedication to student success, starting in his days as a faculty member, which led to a numerous leadership roles. He is also known for his vibrant and enthusiastic teaching in which he puts the care, education, and contentment of his students at the forefront while creating an enjoyable and welcome, welcoming learning environment. Please join us as we delve into his insights on fostering student success and his journey in shaping the academic landscape at Ashland University. Once again, Dr. Mancha, thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate your time and uh, your knowledge. Hey, thanks for having me. This is gonna be interesting. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> It'll go well. Yeah. Um, so, can you give us just some insights and maybe do a little compare and contrast of how you feel your undergraduate years were at Rice compared to what you see undergraduate students facing now at Ashland and other institutions? Oh, that's, that's, that's wow. Okay. Let's see. Um, I had, I have a, a love hate relationship with Rice University. Okay. You know, I went to an all boys uh, private Catholic high school. And I did really well, particularly in the areas of math and science. And my initial desire was to be a mechanical engineer. And I did that kind of work at Rice for several years. Um, but you know, Rice University just beat me up. I mean, to answer your question directly, what we see, at least during my experiences in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, uh, at Rice, I mean, Rice was an incredibly tough university. They um, they molded me and shaped me. I don't know if if into a better person is the right way of putting it, but they definitely toughened me up. Um, there were no tutors. There were no help sessions. There were no circumstances or or issues where I could go in and talk to a professor and get one on one help or assistance in anything that I was struggling with. And so uh, you were basically left on your own. In the engineering program, it was completely cutthroat, you know, and, and we're talking about um, uh, curves where the highest grade out of 100 was a 40, let's say. And so, um, you know, d being in that kind of an environment, you either, you know, rose to the challenge or you, you got left behind. Uh, it's definitely not like that here at AU. I mean, here at AU, we do everything that we can to try and motivate students. Uh, our doors are always open, at least mine is. Um, we have tutors, we have help sessions, we have study tables that they do, I think, with the athletes. Uh, there are so many opportunities for students to be able to succeed if they want to, right? If they want to put in the time and effort um, and get assistance and one-on-one -on -one assistance, particularly. Uh, so, I mean, that's uh, you know, th that's kind of the comparison to answer your question. It, it, you know, it was rough at Rice, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know if I could get in again. <laughs> um, were you allowed to ask the professors questions during class? You you were right. So the professors really spent most of their time, at least in my experience, dealing with things in the classroom, uh, not a lot of stuff outside the classroom. I mean, there were a few, so it's not as if it was completely, you know, sort of, th there were, there were, there were no, there was no interaction between faculty and students, but uh, for a, a large portion of my experience, it really was sort of in isolation, I felt, right? And again, I know we don't do that here, you know, and I hope students don't feel like that's what's going on in their lives here, because I know we do a great deal for them. And that's one of the reasons why I've stayed here, by the way. That's one of the reasons why I went into academia in the first place uh, and you know, decided to stay at a place like Ashland as opposed to a bigger university, let's say a research university. 
Yeah, and I, I think that that's something really special about Ashland. As you mentioned, we have the office hours with our professors. We have tutoring programs. We have embedded coaching where students see the a person in their classroom helping the professor. Uh, we have the writing and communication center where they can make appointments to do um, work on essays, any communicative activity like presentations, digital media. Um, and that's just something... Even even myself, who uh, when I lived in Spain in the early 2000s and took classes over there, um, we were not allowed to ask questions during class. You could not. The professor lectured for an hour and a half, and then mm -hmm. he ran out the door, and you had to run after him if you had a question. And most times they wouldn't even turn around. Yeah, no. I mean, when and when I started studying philosophy there, right? When I moved from uh, the the engineering environment to the philosophy environment, there was a little bit. There's a little more humanity involved right there's a little more uh, interaction that we had a, a lot more questions and answers during class you know th that was always welcomed but again there was still this 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 separation i feel and and from what i understand it's not like that at rice anymore uh, as i mean th this this is a change that we've seen not only at different institutions but i think across the board right with regard to education I think we could definitely agree that it's the positive change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, could you walk us through your journey from a faculty member to uh, taking on the many leadership roles that you have, especially like your department chair of philosophy and how you work to kind of shape your department from the from the top down to help everybody have a positive experience and worthwhile experience? Yeah, uh, let's see what we can do. I mean... Um... When I first got here in 03, obviously, as a new faculty member, um, it was great to have Dr. Vaughn as chair. Dr. Vaughn was the chair during that time. And he did a very generous and um, he played an important role in focusing me and my work towards being able to obtain tenure and promotion. He kept me away from certain political circumstances and very complex things that were going on at the university and helped me to focus my work uh, on what I needed to do in order to be able to sort of uh, develop as a faculty member. I was on a few sort of low powered committees. One of the big committees that I was on uh, was the faculty senate student life committee. So I was the chair of that committee for a good number of years. And, um, you know, I'm still in charge of the philosophy club and our honorary, the Phi Sigma Tau. Uh, and um, early on, students somehow found out that I was interested in lifting. And so I was the coach of the powerlifting club for a few years back then. And that was really fun. That was there was a lot of work involved in that, but that was really exciting. And I found that when I got involved my interest and my focus was really on students. I didn't want to have any part of service areas that weren't really student oriented. I mean, I did a couple of different things, but, you know, I saw my colleagues struggle to change all sorts of curricular and administrative issues and faculty senate and various other kinds of committees. And they did this much to their peril and frustration. And I didn't want any part of that, to be honest with you. And I still don't. Mm -hmm. Um, so I try to stay away from those things because I am just of the opinion that, um, there's not much that I can do, right? Uh, maybe yeah. there are others who can. So, um, during, uh, prioritization way back when in 2014, uh, I was called upon to be chair and I had to make some very difficult and hard decisions about how our program was going to move forward. And, one of the focuses that we had was trying to increase the number of students. We always got the response from a lot of our evaluations that students like to take philosophy. They were interested in it. We helped them in their other majors to, to learn how to think about things and to evaluate information. And yet, um, most of the time we caught them because of the way that things were scheduled. I'd catch them in their junior and senior year. And so there'd be no way for them to be able to pick up a minor or a major. And so we really had to flip that on its head and try to get students to, um, to to start registering for philosophy classes early, right? You know, if I can get freshmen and sophomore students in there and find out, you know, what their interest is and show them the value and importance of learning how to think, then um, many of them had that opportunity to tack us on as a minor or as a second major. And again, it's only a 24-hour major. Uh, it's... Um, 
you know, 15 hour minor, it's really easy to tack on, particularly right. if you are studying in the arts and humanities. Right, right. And so I, everything that I do as a chair is kind of focused around that. So I love to be able to help, you know, advocate for students in their programs. You know, I try to get them answers. You know, I can solve some problems at the registrar's office sometimes that they're unable to, uh, to solve. But, uh, you know, as, as for the rest of it, you know, it's just, it, it's just here, right? Yeah. Well, I could I could tell you for sure that uh, the students really appreciate that student centered uh, kind of mindset where they take priority and where we're here to help them assist them not only in their courses, but everything else, because I'm sure you've heard a lot of different things that you wouldn't have heard in the classroom when you are in the weight room with the with the students, you know, oh, yeah. there's a lot more free communication, things that they're scared to say in class. And they're just like, hey, what do you think about this? And you hear that that idle chatter. And uh, you just get different insights from them. So, yeah, that, that quality time with the students outside of the classroom also benefits us and them because we could have better connections. Yeah. And they realize that you're a person. I mean, I think I still think that there is that division, even though, again, our doors are always open. We're there to help them. I talk to them after class. I try to give them as much time as I can. Um, you know, uh, there's still this little bit of a division and some of it is proper. Yes. You know, professor, yeah. student. But uh, it's almost like grade school. They, they, they. I think many of them just don't think that we're human beings and let do things apart from the university. So you might see a student at Walmart, for example, and they're like, oh, like, like that person, like you know, oh, you go to Walmart? Like, yeah, yeah, I need food and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, it's it's really like that. They they don't quite um, look at us as human beings as mm -hmm. as they ought to. You know, you know, and, and I make mistakes in the classroom, and we laugh about it, and it, it's it's funny just just that 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 distance that the students themselves kind of keep yeah and i think it's important that we we do laugh at ourselves in the classroom especially uh with those uh complex ideas that you're teaching and i'm in language learning so mm -hmm. you make a mistake i tell them the first day like we should be able to laugh at ourselves and gently at our classmates you know in a kind way um and just you know go through this process together because mistakes are will help us learn yeah uh, so never be afraid to make mistakes is what I tell my students all the time. Like it's better that you talk and make a mistake than to be silent and, and worry and, and wonder about something and never have an answer for your question. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really important. That's one of the things that we do at the beginning of almost all my classes. You know, we, we, we recognize the fact, and again, this, this is another thing that has changed with the culture, but, but I think it's changed for the worse. Students are afraid to ask questions they're afraid to make mistakes because they're afraid to be seen as as dumb or foolish or ignorant or you know they don't want to look as if they're right. vulnerable at all they they so they they don't raise their hands they they just sit there when you ask them a question and just stare at you because no one wants to engage and I try to break some of that down as much as I can, you know, so I show them a couple of videos in the beginning of the semester about, you know, how we use our memory. Uh, there's a nice little video. Um, I'm, uh, I'll think of her name in a second, but uh, she's written a book called Being Wrong. And so she talks about the the policies that are involved uh, with being wrong and how we need to change those in the workplaces. But then she also talks about the philosophical circumstances involved. You know, I mean, for example, I mean, being wrong feels just like being right. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> but we feel embarrassed when we find out that we're wrong. Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, and I'd even recommended that we read that book for our Honors 101 at one point. Uh, so that was, it was really significant. And I try to talk them through this. I mean, like, I can't remember what Miss Frizzle tells them, right? She's like, get messy, make mistakes. Right. And I tell them, just, let's do this. This is what we need to do. We need to sort of put down, you know, we, we need to put away this fear. Right. This this fear, because th this is your opportunity to make those mistakes and the, and the costs are low. And I, I think that the, the students being a little bit more timid than they have in the past also has to do with uh, one of the repercussions of COVID and the online, uh, right. that, that lack of contact with people, uh, their classmates and their teachers. Um, it just set us back a little bit. And I, I think our students are acclimating, pardon me, better to the classroom now. But um, yeah, it, it's one of the things I, I stress and I see you do too is just that you have to make mistakes. It's part of the learning process. It's okay to make mistakes. 
It's okay to work something out live in front of your colleagues, in front of your friends, in front of your mm -hmm. classmates, and uh, you'll you'll just grow. Mm -hmm. and it's it's just another opportunity to succeed. Yeah. Um. So I know that you do a lot of engagement. You say with students, but you also do things with faculty members. Uh, one thing, and we'll get to this a little bit more in depth. Uh, that you have done is I've seen you present on um, the uses of AI, what's going on with it. Uh, what other things do you do to engage with faculty members to create a better learning environment for our AU students? Yeah, that's a tough question. And thinking about that, I, I as 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 chair, um, I get to spend a lot of time with my colleagues and hear their concerns and you know their 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 solutions to, to various mm -hmm. kinds of problems. Uh, those chair meetings, I think, are really beneficial. If they're beneficial, it's because I get to hear from my colleagues and see how they're solving problems, how they're addressing various issues on campus. Uh, right now, that's really the, the central part of my involvement, right, and being able to um, talk with my chairs as well as with the chairs in the College of Arts and Sciences, particularly the humanities here. Um, they they in talking about core issues and talking about um, student populations and then majors and kind of really learning from them, those that have a bit more experience than I do, uh, how to be able to manage some of the efficiency difficulties that we're seeing here. Um, I mean, I don't have a lot of interaction with my faculty, with, with my colleagues uh, in other circumstances. I try to be present. Mm -hmm. That's that's really the most that I can do. So. Um, uh, I like to teach all over campus. So, you know, I like to teach in Dauk. I like to teach in Kettering. And I like to be there and kind of interact with my science colleagues just to be present and to see them. Uh, I teach in the library lecture room. That's kind of my, okay. that's, that's my main room that I really like to to teach in. And as well as here, you know, here in Bixler. Um, but I don't really have a good answer to that question for you. I haven't been on a lot of other committees right now where I'm able to address certain kinds of issues or problems. You know, well, I don't even know if it's committees. Uh, one thing I don't think you give yourself enough credit for is that you do really always have your door open. And I go through Bixer about 10 times a day. <laughs> and whenever I see it open, you know, I always stop by and we have a little two minute right. chat and share right. ideas and stuff like that. I think that itself is is a, is a something that helps uh, create a better environment for our students because we could exchange ideas together. Yeah, we I do like to dialogue with my well, Especially somebody who has more experience like you over somebody who's, uh, you know, I. you've been teaching for how many years now? Here at AU for 20. So this is my 20th year at AU. And you taught before that though, right? Oh, as, as a grad a, student. As course, a grad student, Purdue. yeah. And I actually, at Purdue, I had a lot of teaching experience. Before I became a TA, I taught my own classes. Nice. And so I, I TA'd for several faculty mem members there in the philosophy of religion, uh, but I actually taught most of my own classes at Purdue. Um, I designed a class that was not on the schedule. So so at Purdue, they, the, the, the department has a contest where a student designs a course, and the best course is one that gets to be taught the next semester. And I had designed a course on the concept of God. And um, at the time, Purdue was uh, well known for its philosophy of religion program. And so that that course got taught and I was able to teach it on my own. Um, when our medieval professor uh, retired, uh, we didn't have anyone to teach the upper level medieval class at Purdue. And they asked me to do it. And so I designed and taught the upper level course right there at Purdue for the undergraduates. So I had a lot of teaching experience there at Purdue as well. Yeah, and and those kind of opportunities, I mean, that is um, not something that a lot of graduate students get. I was very fortunate uh, at Michigan State to get something similar with uh, designing and teaching new courses and just given a lot of autonomy. And I really feel that it shaped me. I'm only in my, I think this is my 17th year teaching at the university level. Okay. And I mean, every day we're still learning new things, Absolutely. still learning new tricks and still adapting and just addressing the students' needs. Yeah. Um, and one of those is, uh, I told you we'd come back to this, uh, is the AI issue. Uh, yeah. How How is that working 
with your philosophy students? Are you running into issues with it? Are you seeing that it's uh, a tool that they could use or just it's kind of like uh, the, the equivalent of the Google Translate where it could do a job, but it's just, it does a lousy job? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. So, you know, technology is awesome, obviously. It's supposed to help us do our work better and quicker maybe, you know, unless you pick all the systems that we use here at AU. Uh, sorry about that. Um, you can edit that out. But I mean, you know, the fact that you and I are able to communicate right now, right, with our technology is really awesome. But, you know, I wish the students wouldn't use it. How's that? I wish the yeah. students couldn't use it. I wish that it would play a role, you know, it would not play a role at all in any of our future work. Um, and academic work in particular. I mean, the problem with technology in a learning environment, here's the thing, in a learning environment, is that it's so easily deceives students. You know, it, it causes them to confuse like the obtaining of information with actually thinking. And, and what we want to be able to teach them how to do is to think. I mean, I tell my students in class all the time, brains don't come with instructions. So how do we learn how to think? Well, we learn how to think only by example. And so that's why we read all, you know, the, the, the philosophers that we do, because they show us by example how to think through certain kinds of problems. And the examples that the students are getting right now are questionable. I mean, I don't use technology to show me how to think. It's always noticed with an eye to fill in the premises maybe of an argument, to give me the data or information that I might need for something. But the thing that students don't realize is that they don't even know what to research, right? They don't know why the data is important. I mean, they don't know how to construct an argument with the data to defend a thesis or a conclusion or anything like that. And AI only exacerbates this problem because it proposes to do all of that for the student. It completely bypasses the learning process altogether. And they think that what it means to succeed is just to get the answer right. But here's the problem. They don't even know that the answer is right. Mm -hmm. So we have this terrible consequentialism that we're dealing with here at university. I mean, I'm not talking about like not learning how to use it because let's say you're a computer programmer and you need to be able to do this in a job, right? Or you you have a particular uh, area where you, you need to be able to use this technology in your job. I'm talking about using it to learn, right? And it does not do that for us. Right. And again, it deceives students. It gives them a quick fix. They don't even know if chat GPT is giving them the right answer to anything. So it, it, really... kind of, it kind of takes away that process of learning, that process of growth. Um, AI could be helpful to refine things, but if you have nothing that you've cultivated in advance, if you have nothing that you've worked on, you're refining kind of like an empty field. It's just sand and yeah. nothing is going to grow there. Right. I mean, again, as I think I mentioned it in the meeting that we had when we talked about artificial intelligence and its issues, um, we as faculty members you know, are, are, have been charged to really think carefully about what it is that we want our students to learn, right? What are the basic and primary concepts necessary in order to be able to learn whatever our disciplines happen to be? I, I can't tell my, you know, colleagues what those things are, you know, but, um, you know, as for me in my house, we don't need it, right? That's not going to accomplish any positive ends, Right, with regard to teaching students how to reason better. You know, I mean, it's interesting that we have this motto, right? Teaching students how to think, not what to think. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been doing that in philosophy for the past 3,000 years or so. <laughs> yeah. But we don't take it seriously. That's the thing. We don't take it seriously. I wish we did. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, and building on that, the AI also kind of inhibits, it can inhibit um, communication skills among the students. Um, what, what do you do in your class to kind of help help your students develop commu better communication skills um, and not only communicate with you, but with their peers so that in a way that when they go to the job market, when they go and, and try to be uh, somebody out there in the world, that they can successfully communicate what they're doing, what they need to do, what they need help with, uh, and even what they can do. Well, I'll tell you that we're not doing enough. How's that? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the philosophy department, right? I'm I'm taking some ownership here. We used to have an opportunity where students would 
have what was called, um, we called it a conversation, right? Anyone who was a major, they picked a topic or a favorite paper of theirs that they thought they did well on, and they would have an opportunity to sit down with with me and Dr. Vaughn, and at the time, Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Teal to have a conversation, basically have a discussion to be able to talk through their topic and defend it, right? Nothing was at stake, by the way. Mm -hmm. if, I mean, it was possible to fail it, right? So we gave out a pass, high pass, and a fail. And even if you failed it, it's not as if you didn't get your major. But even at the time, and we're, I'm talking about 15, 16 years ago, uh, students did not want to do this. They would rather, here's the funny thing, they would rather be a religion major and take a thesis and defend that thesis. They would rather go into Ashbrook and, you know, do their Ashbrook thesis and defend that. They would rather be an honor student and do their capstone and defend that as opposed to sit down with the three or four of us and have a conversation that, you know, where there was zero skin in the game. And it was really enlightening to find out, you know, how many majors and minors we lost simply because we had that as a condition, right? Hmm. They were all going to have to do it. And so we had to get rid of it. Okay. I mean, we were losing, we were losing numbers. Uh, again, it's really odd how, how that worked out. Um, and we have been trying to rethink this to, to find out a way other than what we do in the classroom, right? Which is to try to get students to engage, to get them to ask more questions. I call on students. I used to, early on, I used to say, okay, well, um, I'm not going to call on you, right? Because I don't want to embarrass anyone, you know, and I hope that everyone sort of understands that and respects that. But that didn't work at all, right? Because students, even back then, rarely volunteered their opinion. And now I just call on students. I just simply, you know, draw them out and try to get them to engage with the material. Because when you're learning how to think, you it's it's very easy, particularly when we read, you know, a text, it's very easy for them to think in their minds, oh, I got this, I've under, I understand this, and I read the handout, and, you know, I heard him discuss that particular argument, that makes sense to me. And then you ask them a couple of simple questions, and you get them to get words out. And when the words come out, that that's really you know, when you're able to assess what they've learned or not. Right. So other than that activity uh, of us just trying to be more engaging with the students to draw out those mistakes, to be able to help correct them and get them the opportunity to reflect on the fact that they really didn't understand what they were hearing. Um, you know, I, I, we haven't come up with, let's say, something departmental wide, you know, like we had with the oral, you know, it wasn't really an examination again. It was just sort of an, an opportunity to have a conversation with us. We've never really come up with anything like that. You know, so I'm not sure if it's us being too sensitive to them or 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 whatnot. Um, well, I think we have the best interest in mind. And uh, my students know that they will talk every class. Like they will say at least one thing. And I, I do the same thing. I, I call on my students. And if they get, if they stumble with a question, if they have a problem, I say, Okay, think about it for a couple of minutes. We're going to go to somebody else and I'll come back to you. So just get your thoughts together because it's important that you can go through that process of metastasizing that idea in your head and then vocalizing it out in your own words to your yeah. classmates. It's right. going to help you and it's going to help them because you might have picked up on something that they did not. Yeah. So it just furthers the conversation. No, I think that that's right. Um and just to kind of toss this out there, one of the things that makes this really difficult for us, even in the classroom, is the fact that we've increased CAPS so much. It's very difficult to have that kind of a conversation with 30 students, mm -hmm. you know, in a 50 minute time period. Yeah. You know, to where I can actually address each one of them or try to engage as many as I can and still give and still give my lecture. Right. And still sort of talk about the material. It's 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 quite difficult to do that. Um, I mean, it's easier to do, let's say, in an upper level course. So in an upper level course, students are always talking. It is a conversation. You know, if I have 10, 12 in a classroom, we've got something manageable right there where we can focus, you know, we can focus deep and wide, right, to steal something from the religion department here. Right? You know, we can focus deep and wide on the various issues that we are trying to do for the day can't do that in an, in an intro course where it's so important, by the way, it's so important to get them engaged early on. It's so important to get them uh, thinking carefully about 
uh, how to learn and to draw their excitement. And so, you know, sadly, uh, you know, and I don't want it to turn into this, but sadly you end up having to, and then you learn how to do this, of course, when you, when you teach at a big school, right? When you've got 150 students that you're teaching, which is what I used to do sometimes, uh -huh. um, you've got to put on a show. Mm -hmm. You've got to, you know, do, you've got to tell jokes. You've got to find some way of drawing them in because you, in, in you know, when you've got 150 students in a huge lecture hall and you're mic'd up, there is no way for you to be able to address questions mm -hmm. that are relevant in an opportunity like that. Yeah, I, I do think that's funny that uh, sometimes students don't realize that the many hats that we wear, we're, we're their professor, we're their clown, we're their psychiatrist, yeah. we're, you know, we're friendly with them. <laughs> um, and my, my wife kills me all the time. Uh, she's a uh, political science professor at College of Wooster, and she'll be like, oh, I said this joke and all the students laughed. And I said, sweetheart, you grade them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's why they laughed. Yeah. <laughs> Um, cause us, okay. us older people, uh, I don't think we're as funny as we think we are a lot of times, no. maybe sometimes we'll have a zinger, one zinger per semester, but <laughs> yeah. they definitely don't get any of my references anymore. I, and I, and I just don't know what they do. I don't know what they watch anymore. I can't figure it out. Yeah, no, they don't, they don't get any of my film. I brought up star Wars the other day yeah. in my ethics class. And I kid you not only one. I'm like, you guys are, are you serious? Only one student knew about star wars do you do anything with joseph campbell um no okay yeah because that would be like the gateway in there yeah with him and george lucas yeah okay um yeah that the my movie references it just crickets they're like yeah. nope we never we never seen that one never heard it mm -hmm. so like we're, i was yeah. like we have to have a, like a movie day <laughs> yeah they don't even know the lord of the rings it's sad you know when yeah. i teach when i teach plato in the ring of gaiges Mm -hmm. I say before there was the ring of power, right? There was the ring of Gyges. Same, same, you know, basic procedure, you know, ring makes you invisible, right? Without all the craziness, mm -hmm. right? without all the wraiths and, and the evil and whatnot. And they just have no idea what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's awful. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. What to do. It's it's certainly a cultural change and we go adapting as they adapt. So yeah. we, I find myself when they say what they're watching, like I look up stuff and I try to see like mm -hmm. how I could incorporate that newer stuff into mine instead of using all my old references that are just kind of in my memory warehouse and easily accessible. Yeah. Um. So going back to Purdue, so you were teaching classes with like 150 students. So oh, yeah. Huge lectures. Huge lecture halls where, uh, you know, you'd have a lecture uh, I'm sure this is sort of a familiar procedure for, you know, for most people in grad school, they recognize, you know, you have this huge lecture hall. So you lecture twice a week and then the class is broken up into three or four recitation sections, mm -hmm. right? Where other grad students take over those particular sessions and you have all your quizzes done in those, uh, in those recitation sections, all the exams are done in the recitation sections. But, you know, the, the lecture itself was primarily a lecture. There really was, you know, not a lot of opportunity for interaction, although you would try. If someone raised their hand, you'd try to address a question or two. Uh, but you were you were there to just sort of get through the material, right? And try to draw in as many of them as you can. Yeah, it was a uh, it was scary. Uh -huh. Um and and that's that's almost harder as a professor to have to run through the material uh in, in such a short amount of time and just try to get through it and not have that communicative uh environment. Uh, and I think one of the cool things that you've talked about and, and something I came across and, and something you said was um, the great task of educating. And you talk about its Latin infinitive, which is educare. Yeah, ed educare. Educare. Educare, right. Uh, yeah. Which means to lead or draw out. Yeah. Um, so how is that? Can you just give us a couple insights on how you do that here at Ashland? And that's it's it's possible here, and that's something you strive for. And it's much much harder at those bigger, bigger universities. Yeah. Um, let's see. Again, this is the problem of teaching students how to think, not what to think. Mm -hmm. the The central difficulty is to get students to recognize that learning or being in a classroom in the learning environment is not 
you know, my job isn't to pop the top of their head off and pour in information. That's that's not what I'm doing at all. And 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 anyone who thinks that learning is like that, I think, is doing those students a severe injustice. Right. That that's not what they're here for. My job is to put them into a sterile but uncomfortable environment. You know, I, I, I don't know what my colleagues are going to think when I say this, if anyone's listening to this, but, you know, the, my, my classroom is not a safe space. Right? It's not a safe space at all, but it's a sterile environment, right? It's a sterile environment where I can push them and challenge them to think about very difficult things, very difficult things in their lives about, you know, for example, in ethics, about what matters most and what matters least and how they go about assessing their values and how they go about making choices on the basis of their values, how they think about human nature. You know, literally, what are you? Are you just a hunk of talking meat or are you something more than that, right? Are you just a bag of chemicals, right? Or is there something more unique about you and how would we go about assessing this? Um, it, 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 it's about putting them in that situation where I can challenge them and get them to have that aha moment for themselves. You know, we've all been in that situation where you're you're in an environment and you're hearing the same lectures, you're reading the same books, you're reading the same notes. This guy over here gets it right away, right? And you're like, oh, man, I hate that guy. And then this person over here, they've checked out. And then you're somewhere in between. And the real challenge is to try to find a way to get the individual to reflect in on themselves, so that they can have that aha moment. And the, the question is, you know, what, what's different? What's different between the experience that you're having and the guy over here who got it really easily and the person over here who's checked out? It's the fact that you've done something, right? You've had to turn inward and reflect on what it is that you have been told and determine for yourself whether it's true. But of course, you need the methods to do that, right? You need the procedure for being able to do this. And that's very difficult. I mean, I'm just telling you, that's difficult to do. OK, um, uh, learning philosophy in many respects, I, I try to make it more objective. Right. So when I give them exams and questions and things like that, I try to get them to tell me specific things about the theory, specific issues uh, that are being dealt with, specific kinds of objections. But um, I mean, you can learn a little bit about swimming by watching videos. Okay. Right. But that won't teach you how to swim. Yeah. You can learn some techniques and some opportunities like, you know, talking about the gym. I talk about the classroom like as a gym. OK, you, you can you can buy a gym membership. Um, you, you can um, go and look around at all the fancy equipment. But unless one, you know, you start moving things around and two, uh, you, you have to move them around with purpose. Right. And do it regularly. And I'm your coach. I'm here to show you how to use this equipment and how to use it well. But ultimately, you're the one that has to continue to come in here over and over and over again so that you can get strong. You can't go at the end of the year, right? If you've never walked into the gym or if you walk in and you just look around and you poke out at things, you can't go up to the people who own the gym and say, I want my money back. You know, I didn't get strong. Right. And so I blame you for that. It's like, no, that's not how it works. And I think of education like that. Uh -huh. Education is is something that the student must practice themselves, and I'm there to guide them. I can't quote unquote teach them. I really can't. And and anyone who thinks that that's what they do, I think, has misunderstood this student teacher relationship. I'm not making them anything. All I can do is coach them, so to speak, to start to think about this material in a different way to value it, to recognize that they might have to strain that muscle a little bit to get stronger and then start using it a bit more carefully, a bit more properly and to give them examples as to how to do this, right? That's all I can do. I mean, that's, that's, that's what learning is. I mean, that's, that's why, again, education, this issue, this issue of, you know, educare, right? To, to educe something from an individual, um, th that's hard work. It's, it's, it's definitely challenging. Uh, I take this job seriously as an educator and it terrifies me and it should terrify most of us because when we really think carefully about what we're trying to do, um, we find that that responsibility is, is, is deep and it is, um, dangerous. It's dangerous. Uh, 
So we, we do the best that we can, right? You know, and I trust most of my colleagues in, in the methods that they try to, you know, you know, present to our students. Um, but I think we've moved away from thinking about learning, learning as as um, you know, sort of training students, you know, training students for a certain kind of living, right? R regardless of what they're going to do for their job, right? I mean, we we need to be we we need to I mean edu the university. I mean, we're, we're you know, uh, if they wanted to make a whole lot more money, you know, maybe they should go and do you know electrical work or plumbing work. Gosh darn it, they'd be making a whole lot more than me. Okay. Yeah. All of us. Yeah. But here at university, the, the goal is different. And we've forgotten this and we can't run this place like a business because when we do, things suffer. And again, maybe we can talk about this uh, at another time, but uh, we, um, uh, we've been trying to do that and we've seen the failures. I think it's really interesting how you, you had that um, idea about us just dispensing the knowledge right into the heads of the students when actually... It, we could carry our students from A to Z. We could. But like you yeah. said, that's that's not what we want to do. We want to help them crawl, walk, and run from A to Z. Mm -hmm. We can't make them do it, but we could assist them in, in learning those steps so that they could do it by themselves and grow yeah. instead of just doing it for them because it just would do a disservice to them at the end. Yeah. I mean, my best students uh are not the kind of students that are going to come up to you and just sort of spew information and try to impress you my best students are the ones that you can have a conversation with <laughs> you, you can have it you can you can have an educated conversation with them about pretty much anything and they will do the best that they can to engage and to listen and um you know they, they'll show their worth in that particular environment oh and they know stuff too but yeah right and I think you touched on something really important there. Much of the learning process is that communicating your ideas. But a lot of it is the the listening, the careful listening mm. to what you're what you're being exposed to. Yeah. Process it. P actually pay attention. Invest in what somebody else is saying and think about it. Reflect on it. See how it helps you and see how it could help you grow and see what you could contribute back to them. Yeah. And keep that conversation going. <clears throat> um. So you did mention a little bit about the weightlifting. Is there any other hobbies or fun facts that you have that maybe people at Ashton don't know about you? Yeah, I don't know about fun facts, and I don't know about what they don't know about me because <laughs> I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm an open book most of the time about certain kinds of things. I mean, I can say, I mean, here's just something strange. People have always asked me about this. I like hedgehogs. Okay, okay. I like hedgehogs. I think they're cute. I don't have one. I don't really want one as a pet, but I like them. And that's why the hedgehog is the philosophy club mascot. Okay. Right. Is there anything particular about hedgehogs that you find interesting? No. Uh, I mean, other you know, they're cute and they're, you know, they're, 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 they're neat looking. And, you know, they, uh, at least, you know, the stuffed animal versions are quite nice, but I, I, don't, I don't know really why I like them. It, 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 part of it stemmed from the fact that my, um, one of my graduate faculty, um, my my dissertation advisor, um, he would use hedgehogs in examples for everything. Huh. I never asked him why. I just thought, well, that's just different. Nobody talks about hedgehogs. You know, I mean, like, why why don't I use giraffes or penguins? And I do. I use sometimes giraffes or penguins in examples. Just we don't talk about these things because they're they're different and they're unique. And, you know, we talk about dogs and cats all the time, for example, we, you know. You know, I try to find something weird to to throw students off. Uh, we talk about shiguas, right? You know, there's a Japanese word for watermelon. Of course, they don't know what that means. And that gets me then, you know, th then that becomes a learning opportunity, right? For me to, to recognize that they can learn a word, spell a word, and recognize that the meaning of a word is not part of the material structure of the word. Right. So we can talk about the difference between syntax and semantics, right? You know, right. Uh, sense and reference and all these kinds of things. But uh, I don't know hedgehogs. They just I just find them interesting. Just... Okay, okay. <laughs> so I've got, so my students give me hedgehogs. I've got a bunch of stuff in my office. Next time you come in, you usually stand at the door. If you turn around, I have store, to look. Yeah, they're all they're all they draw me pictures. They they give me stuffed animals. One guy he three D printed me. You know uh, Reggie, right? Who is our our philosophy club mascot? So. That's that, something. I guess. An, an odd connection. Uh, a stuffed animal hedgehog was the first Valentine's Day present I got from my daughter. 
Okay. So I have no idea why it was a hedgehog. It just it was a hedgehog. Yeah, but it it's was cute. cute. You see it, you're like, oh, there it is. And yep. now they're all over my house. <laughs> no, no, now, now my kids have kind of bought into this. And so, you know, they'll, they'll buy my wife hedgehogs, you know, and so we have some Christmas hedgehogs that we brought out for the holiday. They're all over the house. Um, my son's, my son's girlfriend, uh, you, you know, those big squish mallows. Oh uh, yeah, my kids got those. She, too. she, she bought me a hedgehog. <laughs> and so it's sitting there on the chair. I mean, I, they're all over the place now. So it's just, it's now become a thing. So you have a hedgehog party at your house every yeah. day. Yeah. Okay. There it is. So uh, you've given a lot of great advice um, throughout this whole interview and we really, really appreciate it. Is there any uh, last thing you'd like to impart on our students to help them to be successful, not just here at Ashland, but after just a, a brief one or two lines? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know this is going to sound, you know, cliche right now, but look, take a philosophy class. Mm -hmm. Seriously, don't think that you can leave the university as an educated person without really having the opportunity to challenge your thinking about some basic issues. And and this is the this is the one time that you may have the opportunity to do it, right? These four years, you may you're going to you're going to go out, you're going to get a job, you're going to get a family, life is going to get complicated and you may not have the time to reflect on any of these important issues. So do it now. And uh if not a philosophy class, honestly, let me take it broader. Um you know the the the, the humanities Mm -hmm. are absolutely relevant they're called the humanities for a reason you know they're absolutely relevant for learning how to be an educated person for learning how to uh train ourselves to recognize the things that are of most importance you know when uh, you know i hope that you know on your deathbed we talk about this you know as well uh you're not thinking to yourself gosh i wish i was just in the office one more day you know, I, I I wish I had just filled out those reports one more time. No, you're going to be worried about other things. And those are the things actually that you should have been worried about all along. Mm -hmm. I should have taken care of my mother when she was alive. I should have um, taught my children values. I should have you know, treated my spouse with more respect. Um, you know, things like that. You know, where where if you're thinking about them earlier, you're not going to get to that point in that last part of your life, because those things mold the entirety of your life, the humanities, right? Thinking about these issues of values and choices and and whatnot, not your job. Right, right. I and agree that's, completely. That's what I want students to to really know and understand that I'm trying to give that to them. I, I, you know, in an intro class, you can only do so much, right? But mm -hmm. I'm trying to give that to them. And this certainly is the time. Uh, Ten years ago, I had a lot more time to read Foucault and Zizek, and now it's, it's not so much. But yeah. um, yes, a humanities course, a philosophy course, learn a language. These yes. things will help open up your mind and make you, uh, scientifically, the synapses are, mm -hmm. are going to be firing more when you expose yourself to those higher, higher minded uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very sage advice. And uh, once again, I just want to say thank you so much for your generous time and your insights. Uh, I think that uh, there's so much that we could all learn from you as faculty, as students. So we appreciate your your leadership and your generosity of time and kindness here at Ashland University. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andrew. I appreciate it. Okay. I, I will be looking forward to seeing you on campus. All right. Take care. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to the WOW Podcast, where curiosity meets inspiration. Brought to you by the Writing and Communication Center at Ashland University.